Toba's greetings. I'm your host, Dr. Wolfula, and when I'm not butchering her baker until I make her nightmare, I'm here at the Wolfula reviewing movies. October continues with my review of Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker, aka Night Warning. And I gotta say, neither title makes a whole lot of sense regarding what the movie is about, but I guess this is one of those movies that's impossible to title or even describe, but I'll try my best here. Filthy pig! You think you got it all figured out, don't you? Well, you're wrong! Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker was released in 1981, early on during the slasher movie boom, and it was helmed by an unlikely director, William Asher, who mostly worked during the golden age of television directing episodes of I Love Lucy and Bewitched, and even was married for 10 years to the star of Bewitched, who played Samantha. Man, can you imagine railing the wife from Bewitched? She can cast a spell on my magic wand any time if you know what I'm saying, and I think you know what I'm saying. Anyway, William Asher wasn't the first choice as director for Butcher, Baker, Nightmare Maker. Michael Miller was initially the director, but he only shot the memorable opening of the film before being fired because the financiers thought Miller was taking too long to shoot the opening scenes. When I discuss the opening, though, you can understand why it needed to take some time. Let's begin my review of Butcher, Baker, Nightmare Maker. But first, I have a message from my sponsor. Me! Pledge to my Patreon today to support the channel, help it continue to grow, and you'll also get access to weekly movie nights every Sunday and archive commentaries if you miss the movie nights live. Just five bucks a month to get a movie night every week. Pledge to patreon.com slash drwolfula if you're interested, and I thank you in advance. Good, I'm back in a couple of weeks. Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker begins with Mr. and Mrs. Lynch here embarking on a trip and leaving their distressed son Billy with his totally sane Aunt Cheryl. A fairly benign intro for a horror movie. I don't see how anything scary can possibly happen. Oh my god! Their brakes are out! <laughs> Okay, all right, think fast here. Just swerve out of the way of that truck. <laughs> Jesus Christ, holy shit, no! Come on, Mrs. Lynch, get out. You can still make it. No, no, no. Ah. <laughs> well, maybe she's okay. Oh, no! They had a Galaxy Note 7 in the glove compartment. Oh, cruel fate. <laughs> Oh well, so yeah, little Billy spends the next 14 years growing up without his parents, but he's raised by his Aunt Cheryl, and I think it's safe to say that she does a good job raising Billy, digging through his wallet looking for, uh, condoms? But, but she wakes him up in a totally normal... Okay, this doesn't look like a healthy aunt-nephew relationship at all. What the hell is going on here? Wake up, sweetie me. Five more minutes. Well, Aunt Cheryl remained a spinster, and Billy, well, has been the only male in her life. You know, Billy's gonna be 17 Bye, when Margie. he leaves. You're gonna need a man around the house. And now that he's coming of age and becoming an adult, Billy has made it clear that once he graduates high school, he's gonna get a basketball scholarship, and he's fucking out of this joint. Thing of trying out for a scholarship. Whether his aunt likes it or not. I'm gonna get that scholarship if I can. I'm going away to school and no one's gonna stop me, not even you. So Aunt Cheryl has a deep-seated fear that her boy will finally leave her and she'll be all alone. That Billy's girlfriend, Julia, will take him away from her. Happy birthday. Also, it seems like Aunt Cheryl just really wants to fuck her own nephew. Like, she's down bad for that nephew dick. Good company for each other. Aunt Cheryl, desperate to fill the Billy-sized void in her life and her pants, tries to coerce a TV repairman into having sex with her. Look, lady, I'm just not interested, okay? But he knows better than to stick his dick in crazy, so she sticks a knife in him. <laughs> Aunt Cheryl claims the repairman tried to sexually assault her. You saw him! He tried to me! But the investigators are immediately doubtful of Cheryl's claims. You buy attempted rape? No. Do you? No. Like anyone would want to R her. I kill him! He tried to rape me! Detective Carlson here is especially doubtful about Cheryl's story and is, for no apparent reason, convinced that Billy killed the repairman himself and Cheryl is just trying to protect her nephew. I refuse to answer any more of your questions. Lady, I don't give a shit what you do. 
Things get weirder when it's revealed that the dead repairman was not only gay, but in a relationship with Billy's basketball coach, Tom Landers. And, well, Detective Carlson is not a forward-thinking guy. Forcing the coach into an early retirement... I suggest you resign. If you don't, chances are you're gonna get yourself lynched. But besides that, Carlson does some serious mental gymnastics and jumps to the conclusion that Billy is also gay. Tell me, Billy. Are you a f***? No. And was in a love triangle with his coach and that repairman. So Billy supposedly got jealous and ended up killing the repairman. This is, of course, insane, but part of Butcher Baker Nightmare Makers exploring how bigotry is completely irrational. Carlson, what's your problem? People like you. Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker is ahead of its time in its sympathetic portrayal of a gay character. Coach Landers isn't a stereotype. He's just a nice guy who's into nice guys. But people hate him right away once his private life is revealed, but he doesn't deny it. He stands by who he is, and Billy doesn't throw Coach Landers under the bus, even though Billy is accused of being the coach's boyfriend. I always thought you guys were real close, Lynch. I mean... Real close. Billy denies that, but he still stands by his coach. Do you know that homosexuals are very, very sick? Coach Landers is not sick. Little trivia, the late Bill Paxton plays the bully character in this film. The role of Billy was originally intended for him. The homophobic characters of the film act all high and mighty, but they're horrible people. Aunt Cheryl says gay people are sick, but meanwhile she killed a guy for not giving her a pity lay, yet she's totally normal as a straight woman. She just happens to kind of want to fuck her own nephew. <laughs> Detective Carlson is just as much of a piece of work. He's fixated on proving a 17-year-old boy is gay so he can send the kid to jail. I'm gonna ask you again. Are you a f***? You're crazy. He's a total fascist who uses his authority to purge his community of undesirables. To him, gay people are bad just for being gay while he's busy trying to coerce confessions from suspects at gunpoint. Bullshit. The detective is blinded by his hatred to the point where he isn't willing to listen to reason and, you know, do his job right. One of his associates at the precinct, Sergeant Cook, played by Britt Leach, the guy you might remember as the toy store owner in Silent Night, Deadly Night, well, Sergeant Cook actually bothers to do detective work, focusing on the aunt who actually claimed to kill the repairman, discovering some suspicious aspects of Aunt Cheryl's backstory. See, I don't think that Billy Lynch had anything to do with the murder. I kind of see it different. That she dated a guy who went missing named Chuck Strang, and that the death of Billy's parents may not have been an accident. And they remember that there were rumors about the brakes being tampered with. But Detective Carlson doesn't give a shit about Cook's findings because they don't validate Carlson's own narrative based entirely around prejudice. He grew up without a father, with only women around. It's a classic case, Cook. It's a very uncomfortable movie, but Billy's character made me want to keep watching just to find out what becomes of him. And yeah, Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker doesn't seem like much of a horror movie to start out. This was the early era of the slasher film boom before Halloween's and Friday the 13th sequels, when slasher movies were more focused on character-driven drama, exploring dark, taboo subject matter, oftentimes involving traumatized, sexually confused villains before, you know, it became clear that audiences were flocking to theaters for cooler, larger-than-life villains like Jason and Freddy. Still, Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker might be front-loaded with weirdness, but it is a slasher movie. It just takes a while to get to the slasher part, but I can't talk about that without spoiling the movie's twists. So if you don't want to get spoiled, skip to this time code. The big basketball game that will determine if Billy will get a scholarship has finally come up, but unbeknownst to Billy, but known to us, Aunt Cheryl has slipped Billy a Mickey in his pregame milk, which causes Billy to choke out on the court and wake up in his new bedroom, which he'd be stoked about if he was four, and, you know, I'm starting to think Aunt Cheryl might be fucking nuts. You like? I guess so. I knew you'd be thrilled. And after she gives herself this haircut, I can definitely confirm she's fucking nuts. Nobody with a haircut like that isn't fucked in the head. What did you do? You lie. Yeah, I did it myself. I think it makes me look younger. Billy's for some reason suspicious that something's wrong with Cheryl, and Billy has his girlfriend Julia distract Aunt Cheryl while he investigates the house for clues about Chuck Strang, the man Cheryl is obsessed with. Meanwhile, after Aunt Cheryl beats her meat, she beats Julia. 
soon after Billy takes another swig of milk, he gets knocked out again. Ah, curse Billy's love of dairy products. I still say you should call a doctor. Why don't you go home? I don't need you anymore. It's here where Aunt Cheryl reveals to Billy that she isn't his Aunt Cheryl at all. She's actually Billy's real biological mother. I'm your mother. Chuck's your father. Cheryl was unfit to be a mom, so her sister adopted Billy. And to keep Billy for herself, Cheryl cut the brakes on the car of Billy's adopted parents, causing them to, well, uh, die. So my sister and her husband adopted you, but then I wanted you back. So yeah, Aunt Cheryl is Billy's real mother, which makes all the incest stuff even worse. This twist would end up being repeated a couple years later, either coincidentally or not, in Psycho 2, where it's revealed that Norman Bates' aunt is actually his mother. Are you really my mother? The woman you thought was your mother was my sister. I had you when I was very young, out of wedlock. Until Psycho 3 took the twist back and said, nah. Mrs. Fall was your aunt, Norman. She was in love with your father, but your mother stole him away from her! Cheryl's friend Margie, normally willing to look the other way regarding Cheryl's obvious batshit insanity, decides to stick around and find out what really is going on in Billy's house, and, you know, it's pretty fucking weird. Yeah, this shit is definitely really fucking weird. Realizing she's seen enough, Margie gets the fuck out of here, but it's too late. <laughs> Margie thinks you can reason with a woman brandishing a machete, but you really just can't. It's impossible. When Julie comes to in the basement, she discovers that Chuck Strang, the dude Cheryl used to bang, was given the Walt Disney treatment, and Julia tries to escape before she meets the same fate, but ends up in Aunt Cheryl's sights. Sergeant Cook tries to come to Julia's aid, but we find out the origin of Thing from Adam's family, and Cook gets a pussy where his neck used to be. After a little cat and mouse, Cheryl goes easy on Julia, and by goes easy on, I mean drowns her in a nearby pond and cracks her skull open with a rock. When Billy wakes up from another milk nap, he tries to call the cops, but Mommy ends up choking him instead. So Billy stabs the bitch with a letter opener. I don't know how he went this long without killing this bitch, and Cheryl dies how she lived. Really into incest. Ah. I killed my mother. Except she isn't dead, and after one last murder waltz, the only way to kill a woman who needs to get laid is by getting up in her guts. Now, you'd think with Cheryl being dead, there'd be a happy ending, but no. It's like in a video game where you think you beat the final boss, but there's another boss you have to deal with. There's still the issue with Detective Carlson here, convinced Billy carried out all the killings with Coach Landers. Son of a bitch. Yeah. With the detective seizing his opportunity to execute two innocent people he perceives as murderers, and worst of all, gay. <laughs> After a struggle though, Billy manages to grab the detective's gun and blast the motherfucker away. Now, you think, okay, Billy killed a police officer. He's definitely screwed now. The U.S. justice system is gonna chew him up and spit him out. But don't worry, text seriously scrolls across the screen, quickly explaining that a jury found Billy innocent due to a temporary insanity, and him and his high school sweetheart go to college together. Also, this film is dedicated to the brave Mujahideen fighters of Afghanistan. I don't know what's up with that last part. Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker is an upsetting, weird movie like a lot of these early 80s slasher films. It's thematically and narratively similar to the original Friday the 13th, Sleepaway Camp, and Silent Night, Deadly Night, but it's not scary or gory, it's just kinda uncomfortable. Yet its weirdness and social commentary makes it a very compelling watch, even if it's not particularly fun to watch. The film is a lot more forward-thinking than many of its more popular peers, but I can understand Butcher, Baker, and Nightmare Maker being mostly forgotten due to its sketchy subject matter. It's like a car crash, though. Horrible, but you can't look away. I give Butcher, Baker, Nightmare Maker a butcher and a baker out of a Nightmare Maker. Now, you might be wondering, Doc, do you suffer from any unresolved issues with your own mother? And of course I don't. Things between me and my mother were just fine. Uh, excuse me for a second. <laughs> I killed my mother. Before I go, give goulashes and eyes new riff view of Scooby-Doo, the mystery begins a watch on the Gulag channel today. 
Link in the description. Subscribe to the Gulag channel too. I command it. Finally, now it's time for Doc's fan mail. Dan S. drew a Scooby Doc. Me is Scooby Doo himself, for Scooby Doo is me. Gets confusing. Ashley L. of Magpie Creations made me quite a few crocheted dolls the past year, including Leatherface, Michael Myers, and even my good pal Scooby Doo. Cute. If you have any fan mail to send me, be it a letter, artwork, or a film you'd like to see me review, feel free to send it to my P.O. Box, Dr. Wolfula, P.O. Box 618-305, Orlando, Florida 32861. If you'd rather just send me an email, you can reach me at drwolfulafanmail at gmail.com. This video is made possible through the pledges of my Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to my shoutouts tier. All of the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VIP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfula. Also, check out official Dr. Wolfula t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash drwolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. Dr. Wolfula signing out.